Welcome, everybody. My name is Elena Cabral, and I'm the faculty advisor to the NAHJ student group. A number of our members are here. Um, Angie Hernandez is uh, co-hosting this uh, with me and sort of is at the controls there to make sure we're not missing any questions. Thank you, those of you who are joining us from outside the institution and our community. Mariana's network reaches far and wide, and we are pleased to have some had to have all of you with us. Um, I'm just going to launch right into this. Uh, you've all seen the um, the notes for this for this event and the timing for it for our students, which comes just before our big career expo on April 10th, and then there's another one in the summer on June 12th. Generally speaking, our students are really working intensely until the very day of that expo and don't have a lot of time to prepare. And so it's always good for us to have these kinds of workshops where someone from our community, a graduate who has done very well in uh, her industry, can share um, her ideas and thoughts, especially as an author of someone, uh, an author of a book on uh, being successful, not just successful in general, but successful in, on your own terms. That is to say, how to be a very genuine person. We give you a lot of advice about what to say, you know, what not to say, who to be, what kind of um, phrases and words to drop in, in, in um, interviews. But a lot of the time, the advice of just be yourself um, can go a long way. It's just that we don't always know what that means. And Mariana is here to, to tell us more about that. Gracias. Bienvenidos a todos. Welcome, everybody. Can you see me okay? Yep. Hear me. I want to say yep. thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Elena, to Angie, and to the deans of my school for this incredible opportunity. Let me just begin by saying it's truly one of the pleasures of my life to speak before you today. I know exactly where you are and to some degree who you are, because not long ago, I was you. As we just heard from Elena, I came to the United States on a scholarship from Venezuela to study at the journalism school. I'm generous because the school deserves it. I mean, the J school was my springboard to a better life, literally, after the crisis in my country threatened my dreams of becoming a journalist. I know we have a lot of Venezolanos on here and people that have had to leave their home country. So I know many of you can relate. And in that sense, I have a pretty good idea of what it's taken each of you to get here to this Zoom call, to the halls of the journalism school. And that's why I always tell people when they attend one of our TEDx conferences or buy our book or see one of my reports on television. This is not a couple of years journey, you know, getting to the point where you are now and where you want to be in the future, it's decades in the making. I know it's your family sacrifice in the making, it's blood, sweat and tears. And we're a point where you have to make it all worthwhile. And I still remember what it feels like going through the stressful first interviews, la presión, the pressure of comparing yourself to your classmates with the, did you see what he or she got? Where they got a job or this idea? This is what I used to tell myself. Like, le decía a mi papá, everybody's got something lined up and I don't. You know, it's like that uh, wear sunscreen speech that goes, sometimes you're ahead, sometimes you're behind, but in the end, the race is long and it's only with yourself. Exactly. But the anxiety of graduating and finding that first job that will set you on the track of success you've envisioned for yourself is there. And you guys, on top of everything, have had to do it during a pandemic. I can't imagine what it's been like. So as Elena said, you're at an inflection point and I'm going to talk to you guys the way I wish someone would have spoken to me when I was graduating. The most important piece of advice that I can give you, three little words. Son tres palabras. It's a famous song in Spanish that says that. Be uniquely you. And I know everyone regurgitates the old, like, be yourself. And everybody else is taken. But nobody really teaches you how to okay. do it. We're going to discover that today. Including how to discover the power of you to achieve success in your own terms. 
And we're going to talk about how to make a successful demo tape, how to impress recruiters, and how to get the job of your dreams. So are you ready, J School, and my J School invites? Are you ready to make 2021 the year that will catapult you to iconic status? I want everybody to say yes, no matter where you're watching me from. You're at home, you're at the office, you're watching on your phone. Yes. Okay. So in order to do that, we first have to learn to navigate two of our biggest fears, the fear of uncertainty and the fear of failure. To face both requires a change in perspective. And I know it's hard because we're all overachievers here in the Zoom call. You wouldn't be at the J school if you weren't. So fear of failure and fear of uncertainty is tough to get over. Let's start with uncertainty, right? In the past year, we turned the TV on, we're on our iMessages or WhatsApp or Signal groups. Nobody has the answers, right? And we don't know when this is going to end. You know, you keep asking yourself most likely like, is this what the last couple of months of J school are going to look like? The uncertainty will still be there, my friends. It's the new normal. And it's tough because I've researched this when I speak to many of the executives at the companies where I'm hired now. You know, neuroscience tells us that our brains prefer security and predictability. That you won't get much of in journalism, okay? And when we segregate too much cortisol and adrenaline, that can lead to panic and we're not sleeping well. But if you want to be successful in this career, and now's the time to start doing it, you won't be able to avoid the uncertainty. And now think about, you know, really around the world, everyone is going through it. So whoever can best control their response to uncertainty wins. Facing uncertainty is going to be, and I want you to, to start it with me today, is this inner declaration that with time and hard work, you guys, everything is going to work out. I wish somebody would have told me that when I was graduating from a journalism school. With time and hard work, you will find your place. Everything is going to work out. But by the end of our session today, we're going to give you, as we say in Spanish, una ayudadita. That's why Elena, Angie, and I, and the rest of the Columbia Journalism staff is here. We're going to give you practical tools, action items to take control of this next great chapter of your life and career. So that's uncertainty. What about our friend failure? the goals that we established that we're unable to meet now, right? When you said, I'm going to have an internship lined up by, you know, April, and it's not happened. The interviews that you wanted, but you haven't gotten. It's a normal part of the process, guys. Like I said before, don't compare your timetable with anybody else's. I got my internship for after Columbia. Okay, I'm going to get closer. In June, in June after we graduated, okay? So, Honestly, failing, failing isn't the end of the world. Sometimes it feels like it, but it's not. So here is the change in perspective. Failure is a necessary stepping stone to growth and success. They're actually two sides of the same coin. One doesn't exist without the other. It's like that um, if poem by Royal Kipling, that line where he goes, if you can face triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. Two parts of the same coin. And to prove it to you, okay, I want everybody to raise your hand if this is a yes for you, wherever you're watching me from. How many of you learned how to ride a bike in two wheels in the very first attempt? Raise your hand. Anybody? I hope that I'm hearing crickets around the Zoom meeting because it's pretty unlikely that that happened to you, right? I'm sure nobody's raising their hands. The chances are slim to none. We all needed to fall down. We all needed those little training wheels that our parents, right, and the grown-ups put on the back of the bike. Yet globally as a society, we place value only on success, on that picture-perfect moment when you took off on the bike by yourself. But we don't really remember the training wheels, right? We don't really give them any importance. So listen to me now, because I am so impatient. So I know how you feel sometimes, but remember the training wheels. We all have to go through the process. Use them as a metaphor 
on the importance of going through the motions in life. In this new reality, failure is a necessary stepping stone to success. And in fact, it's already pushing us to discover our real strength. So let's find them, okay? And in order to do that, because many of you may have more time at home, so I want to actually tell you, since we're talking about failure, about the first big failure of my life and how that led me to discover many of my inner strengths. And you're going to take time now after our session today to discover that for yourself. After Columbia University, like I mentioned, I got an internship at a newspaper, which sponsored my work visa. Even though at the time, so I graduated 2009, we had broadcasting, print, digital. I specialize in broadcasting and I wanted to be on camera talent desperately. But what I got was a job at a newspaper that didn't have that, right? But I said to myself, you know, I got my foot in the door. And as an international student, the visa stuff was obviously critical for me. So I was like, you know, everything seems to be going perfecto. And then something unexpected happened. I remember I walked into the newsroom. In fact, I had gotten a really big interview with none other, if you're watching the HBO Max show now, than author Isabel Allende. So it was a huge get. She was in New York promoting her latest novel. And I walked into the newspaper after my really big interview and they were like taking away the furniture. I've been working there for a year as an intern and then as a reporter. And I'm like, what's happening? Well, it was still the ripple effects of the recession of 2008, not unlike what's happening now. And there were cuts everywhere. And that day, you guys, I got laid off. Talk about failure, right? This was my first ever job in journalism, my first ever job in America, to put it in perspective. To be honest, this is a funny story that I tell, funny now, but the only time I had seen someone get fired in the United States was in that movie, Jerry Maguire. You guys remember that movie from the 90s? So remember that scene when Jerry Maguire like gets laid off and he's like, who's coming with me? And there's nobody's coming with him. So he says, the fish, there were these fish in a bowl. And he goes, the fish are coming with me. So I literally like was remembering that scene. And I remember that I had left some like pudding snacks in the fridge. So I took my little pudding snacks and I walked all by myself with a friend of mine to the elevator. And I'm like, these pudding snacks are like the fish in Jerry Maguire. And they're coming with me. And kidding aside, I like walk in the elevator and the door shut and I just like just started crying because my visa depended on that job. I called a lawyer, which I, you know, didn't even have in my contact list. And they told me that I could either become undocumented or have to go back to Venezuela. I had to find a job that would sponsor me in something like a month. So all of this just spelled out badge of failure for me, right? And in Venezuela, my country was already going through a crisis. So that wasn't even an option. I just kept repeating to myself, like, this can't be happening. This wasn't the plan. It was in that moment, and I was talking to Elena about this off camera before we went live today. It was in that moment, a year after graduating from Columbia, that I called none other than the career services people at Columbia University. I had nobody in the United States And they became my family. Ernesto Sotomayor, Julie Hartenstein, they were my support system. And I said, what do I do? So this was something that I kept hearing as I was graduating, like, make sure you keep in touch, you have contacts with the career services people, went in through one ear, went out the other ear. I didn't realize that they were always going to be there for me. So that's something that I want to leave you with today. Make sure you have their numbers. If you're an international student and knock on wood, this won't happen to you, but always have the number of a lawyer handy. Know what your options are in case something like this happens to you, because I really want you to not have to go through the uncertainty that I went through. So anyway, I get home and this is probably like the lowest, one of the lowest points in my life. And because I had nothing else to lose, literally, I remember I looked in the mirror and I said, okay, what do I even have to offer an employer, right? What makes me unique? Who am I really, right? It was a reset in my life. 
And I started making a list and my list had all of these pros, but it also had all of these negatives. You know, I, I remember I wrote things like, okay, I'm from South America, from Venezuela, somewhere different. I can't change that, right? I don't have a visa. I can't change that. English is in my first language. I have a slight accent. I had a stronger accent back then. I have a weird sounding name for television, right? My full name is Mariana del Carmen Atencio Cervoni. But even just Mariana Atencio, right? It's not something that I saw in the top three networks. The top three networks weren't even taking people that didn't have green cards. So that was already a barrier there to begin with. I realized in short that I couldn't change anything in that column. They were facts and they didn't make me hard to market. But, you know, I looked at that list and I said, well, this also makes me unique. So as it pertains to you guys, how can you take the things that make you special and parlay them into a career in digital, in broadcasting, in print, in radio? You know, the ones who took my prior class here at the journalism school, how can you create a lasting brand in journalism using what makes you you. So in my case, it was convincing, convincing executives and recruiters that I could cover immigration with a firsthand perspective because hello, I was going through it. It was the fact that I could cover the Latinx community like few other reporters could, that I could cover Latin America with a firsthand perspective and knowledge. And that I could get those viewers for us, right? And, and telling them, like, nobody can do it like I can. So what would happen if you, watching me today, took what you consider these imperfections? Like, I talk to a lot of young people who tell me, you know, I'm the first in my family to go to college. And, and they're not proud about that fact. Make it part of your lasting brand. If you are Black, if you're Latinx, if you're a woman, if you're an immigrant, if you have uh, a special name that's unique, instead of agonizing over the way you look, you know, don't agonize about it. Include, include it in your resume, okay? Build confidence around it in your recruiter interviews. Include them in your Instagram, your LinkedIn profiles. More than 10 years after graduating from the journalism school and, and many accolades later, I can tell you, cookie cutter won't get you anywhere. What makes you different is what will make you stand out and be successful. And just to give you an example, something like my name, which I mentioned, which in the beginning, you know, there's a, a clip online uh, that I did for Ariana Huffington's Thrive back in the day. And I said, this is Mariana, and this is how I thrive. And I look at that now, I'm like, who is Mariana? I don't know who that is, right? I, I, I even changed my name to make it sound more mainstream, the source of my power. So over the years, I got the courage to hold on to my mic 10 years later at NBC News nationally to say, this is Mariana coming to you live. And nobody forgot that on TV. And yes, it may have been harder for anchors to pronounce, but don't change who you are to make other people comfortable because you have to realize that it's about more than you. It's about all the other Marianas and Elenas and Angies that are watching you, other people who are first in their families to go to college or who come from communities who never thought they would make it on national television or in a national newspaper. By being yourself in these interviews that you're facing now at the J school in your first jobs, you know, wherever your career will take you, you will create space for others as well. And that, like I told you in the beginning, you want to be iconic, that's iconic status. You know, something like English not being my first language, you know, in the beginning, I, I agonized over it, right? But when I was at NBC News, you guys may remember there was a pretty terrible uh, earthquake in 2017 in Mexico City. And I, and I called the network executive and I said, send me, send me, send me. You know, there were already like two crews on the ground. She's like, oh, almost like to stop me, like keep me from nagging any further. She said, OK, Mariana, we're going to send you. And I got on the ground and we were at this primary school where they were still searching for little kids. And, you know, they were literally pulling people out of the rubble. And I just started interviewing them live in Spanish, 
translating in English. We were live almost for six hours that day because nobody could tell the story like I could with the raw emotion that really needed no translation. And when I got back to Rockefeller Center in New York, someone told me like, wow, you know, the president of the network said that it was a career making moment for you. I made that moment because I covered the story with, with humanity and that humanity made me stand out. So cookie cutter didn't get me here. Cookie cutter won't get you to your dream destination. So what is my first call to action for you? Make your list. I have my little list right here. I keep it handy. We're going to include one in the packet that we're going to send to you after class today. Literally start writing. My name is blank. You know, what makes me perfectly me is blank. I tell people, start with three words, three adjectives that make you uniquely you. You'd be surprised, guys. We analyze social media, performance, schools, jobs. When have you ever stopped to analyze yourself? You know, include the things that you bring to the table, things that you also don't think really jive with journalism, you know, different majors, like quirky hobbits or in hobbies or interests that you have, uh, sports that you love. All of these things may come in handy during these interviews, right? Because a journalist is really supposed to know about many things. You have to be able to cover many things and be passionate about things that they can then send you out to cover specifically. It's all made you who you are. And I encourage you, especially when you finish your list, share with your classmates, right? This is not something to be ashamed of. This is not something to be hidden. Share with me on social media, right? I will repost you. Share it with the Columbia Journalism class Instagram handle. This card that you will fill out is the most exceptional gift you have to offer the world. Post it on your bathroom mirror, right? Raise it up like your flag. And when you talk about or think about failure, don't think that you're alone. I already told you my failure story, but mine is just a small story next to people like Walt Disney, who I don't know if you guys know, was once fired from a, a newspaper for like not being creative enough. Or the guy who wrote the world famous book, Chicken Soup for the Soul. When I was looking for publishers for, public, for Perfectly You, I found out this man, Jack Canfield, got rejected by 144 publishers. I don't know how he got the courage to go to the 145th publisher, but he did. You know, Jack Ma, the, the guy who founded Alibaba, he got rejected from Harvard 10 times. You are already a Columbia journalism graduate. So you have so much, so much going for you. And then when I tell you to shout this from the rooftops, is because sometimes we're so afraid to really tell the world what we want or who we are. You know, I remember many of you who come from conservative families, this may be your case as well. I was kind of terrified of telling my family in Venezuela that I wanted to be a broadcast journalist, right? There weren't many women in my country that chose that kind of a profession. It was also dangerous, you know, and I felt that it was kind of like self-centered to say like, I want to be on camera talent. My mom, her wish, she wanted me and my sister, my sister's here, by the way, because she works in my production team now. She would say to us, I need you this. I would love for one of you to be a dentist. That way you can have your practice for half the day, raise your kids and have a family for the other half the day. And nothing against dentists. But I was like, I don't want to be like putting my hand in people's mouths all day. Like I want to be jumping off planes and I want to be on television. And I was so scared of telling my family and the world what I wanted to do that I actually in Venezuela studied communication as for undergrad, then advertising. And then finally I was sitting at an ad agency and I'm like, what am I doing? I'm like, this is, I'm bored out of my mind. And that's when I decided to apply to the journalism school. So whether we wanted to or not, you know, we have all been thrust into this collective transformation, a moment to, Stop and think. This is the gift coming out of this pause, right? Getting to know yourself better, realizing how uniquely amazing you are. And we strive to be perfect, I know, because we're terrified of failure or letting down the people that trust us. 
But here's the thing about perfection. And this is why I titled my book the way I titled it. Nobody's ever learned anything from perfection. Nah, it's capped. It's fixed. Doesn't leave any room for growth. In perfection, there's no passion. There's no innovation. You need a lot of that in journalism. The word perfection needs to be redefined. It's not the absence of flaws. I wrote about it in my book. It's the commitment to give our best to everything we do. So give your best in this next great phase of your life and career, and you will get where you wanted to go. Thank you so much. Gracias. And now I am open to Q&A, and I know Elena has some questions lined up for me, and anything else that you guys want to talk about. You know, as I said, the students are going to have this uh, really unique experience at the expo, which is not like the other kind of career fairs that you might have had in college, where it's kind of a, a free for all and people kind of wander around and most people are just sort of like standing in the corner, try, overwhelmed, trying to figure out who to approach. We make these 20 minute interviews based on what students tell us and what employers tell us. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like speed dating. And like speed dating, you get like a very small uh, window of time to make an impression with a uh, recruiter who is going to talk to dozens of other people um, that same day, maybe classmates of yours who are taking the same classes, accumulating the same skill sets. Um, and so you've got a very small window to make an impression. What are the top, say, three things that you think people need to remember when they have that short space of time uh, to in, in which to leave um, a, a me an indelible memory on recruiters who, let's face it, don't remember everybody's name. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I would say you don't even have 20 minutes, you have something like five minutes, right? You have to have that elevator pitch ready of what makes you special, right? Who are you and why would I want to hire you? I have actually some slides ready for you here that I want to show you guys. Hold on. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Let me know. Aha, uh -huh. here we go. My do's and don'ts for interview. Yeah, do you see them? I don't think I see them. You don't see them? No. Just uh, start sharing again. Do you see them now? Like mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Do's and don'ts for interviewing. Most important thing, guys, smile, make eye contact, and be present. I know it's overwhelming. You're in this career fair. There's a lot of sort of room noise. But just try to look at the recruiter in the eyes and smile. Many people, this is simple. You don't even need any, any academic skills for this. Many people will remember the impression, right, that you caused on them. It's like that, that famous Maya Angelou quote, right? People won't remember what you said or did, but how you made them feel. This is kind of like that. They're going to say, hmm, that Angie girl, she had a good attitude, right? I mean, just it's, it's all about creating that presence in the beginning. There's a book that I recommend you guys read uh, by Olivia Fox Cabane. You can also watch her um, talk that she gave at Harvard University. She wrote a book called The Charisma Myth. She talks about this, right? It's just kind of showing interest and listening to what the person has to say, which is the second part. As a journalist, you will have to develop that skill to listen. What are they interested in? It's not about you sort of imposing what you want to cover, what you're interested in, or what you think the news is or the newsroom should be covering. Just, just listen intently to, you know, what kind of a reporter or a producer do they want to hire? What are the topics that their audience is most interested in or their readers are most in, more interested in, right? Read body language. That's super important. This, obviously, as you're saying, your pitch, right? I remember that when I interviewed at NBC News, and this was a big deal interview for me because coming out of Univision, right, the Univision, very few of us really got the opportunity to interview at, at an English language network, let alone for a national position. And I interviewed with an incredible executive. Her name is Janel Rodriguez, who gave me the opportunity to, to be at NBC. And I remember that I had done uh, a morning show. And I'd also done investigative reporting. 
I wanted to pit myself as the, as the morning show person, right? I dreamed of being on the Today Show and, you know, I have a, this bubbly personality and so much range. And, and I was telling her about this and her body language told me she's not interested in that, Mariana. So I quickly pivoted and you have to learn how to do this in, yeah, five, 10 minutes. When I made the pivot to talk about my investigative chops, immediately, like, her body language changed. Like she smiled, she was engaged. Like I could see it in her eyes and I went that route and I ultimately got the job because I was able to turn it around. And then I said, okay, I'm going to go in that room's room and then I'm going to make it what I want. Right. And that's a slide that I want to show you guys here. Here we go. Don't limit your dreams to your current job or your circumstances. Make it a stepping stone to where you want to go, right? In my first job in journalism at that newspaper, it was a print job, right? But I said, why don't I go out with a little camera that I have and I make videos for you guys to put on the website or on social media? I wanted to be on camera and it, is, it was my way of using that job as a stepping stone. So whenever you're out with these folks at the career fair, don't think that, oh, if you get that job or that position, that's going to be your end all be all. The important thing is to get your foot in the door and then you're going to make it what you want, uh, hopefully. So let's go to the third one, which is very important. It's a famous Steve, job, Steve Jobs quote, stay hungry, stay foolish. Why do I say Steve hung stay hungry? Because you want to, you need to want it really bad. Okay. Um, I remember an agent at CAA told me once when I was interviewing there, they said, well, Mariana, your resume is great. And she asked, but do you have the stomach for this? And I was like, wow. So nobody had ever asked me that question. And in Spanish, we say, tienes que tener piel de elefante, right? You have to want it bad enough. You have to be able to withstand constructive criticism or destructive criticism sometimes. And I say stay foolish because you're also going to want to be open-minded about some of the things that they may ask you to do or that you're going to volunteer for that you never imagined you would do. At this newspaper, it was my first job. You know, they asked me, do you want to go cover the firefighter's calendar in New York that I had to like report on and record with my camera? And I'm like, oh, so when I was there, I'm like, I never in a million years thought that I would be doing this, but here I am. When I started out at Univision, somebody asked me, you guys, if I, they had a, this party for our Basel in their house. And somebody said, like, do you want to go and maybe record some content, some content? I was the girl in the door with my tripod and my camera recording this person's Univision talents private party for our Basel. So many people would have thought, okay, that's, that's beneath me to do, right? I have a degree from the journalism school. But I had nothing to do that evening. I didn't know if ultimately there, which is what ended up happening, I would meet other on-camera talent and I would meet other producers and people that throughout the years were going to help me because they're going to say, you know what, this girl, she was always hungry for it. She was always willing to work the extra mile. Four, the three Ps, show your personality in these interviews, your passion and position that at the company, right? Show who you are what we found out with our Perfectly You cards that you guys are going to do and position that at the company. I can cover immigration. This is why you need to cover it in a unique way. Uh, I see that you are lacking in this. This is where I feel that I can fill a gap, for example. And be ready to answer questions like, why journalism? How much do you expect to earn? This is so important. I recently hired uh, somebody, a producer, for Go Like, our production company, and we asked her that point blank. Every other interviewee had said, especially women, Yo no sé, I don't know, how much do you think that I should earn? This girl came with a number and she said, boom, this is what I expect to earn. This is what people, other people in the marketplace are getting paid for this position. We ended up hiring her. And also be prepared to answer things like, why on camera? Do you think that you can really be on camera? Say yes, and these are the reasons why. Don't be shy or ashamed, and it's all the better if your answers are uniquely tied to who you are. And my final point, fifth one, tell a good story. 
This is so important because in many of the interviews that I do now, even for original production or whenever I'm going to host a show, many of these executives want to know, well, what's the story that you'd be passionate about covering? Tell me the story. And you have to grab them from the beginning. Like, Elena, did you know there was a woman in Florida who's adopted more than 1,000 children of immigrants? They call her the immigration angel. And her name is Nora Sandigo. Immediately, Elena's going to say to me, a thousand children, Mariana, tell, tell me that story, you know? So have these stories from your community ready, have those elevator pitches ready, because they're going to also evaluate your ability to tell that story and to keep them interested. And then finally, if you are doing this virtually, which I think that you're actually going to have a physical career fair, but if you're not, have your virtual setup ready, be super professional. I don't want to hear about you guys running around five minutes before setting everything up and getting like an unmade bed, bed, you know, arranged behind you or like dirty laundry, none of that. So make sure you rehearse it, make sure you videotape yourself and that everything is ready as it should be. And then I've included an additional slide here about the don'ts. And this is pretty straightforward, but you never know. I'm still including it for you guys. Five things that you should never say during these interviews, right? I've never done this type of job before. Don't focus on your lack of experience. Don't complain about prior jobs or teachers or any of that. Don't ask about flexible schedules or vacation time. Don't talk about your personal drama. And then finally, never, never say, I don't have any questions. Mm. Yeah, that's a good one because a lot of our recruiters, because it's such a stressful time of year and gosh, then you have the overlay of the pandemic and everything. Um, I've heard recruiters come out and saying, why are your students so grouchy? <laughs> you know, they're just like, I'm so tired. I'm slab. I'm, this so, it's so hard. This is like, you know, um, those are things they don't want to hear because they're going through it too. And um, so that's great advice. Um, Angie, I think uh you have uh, the second question. Okay. Or is it Bianca? Bianca, do you, I know that there is a class. Bianca, are you there? Yeah, I can ask. We just posted in, in the group as well. We wanted to know how long should reels for video jo jobs be? And if a student in their last semester doesn't have like current clips or any clips at all, how should they work around that? Okay, so I actually have my current reel for you guys to see. And I have how my very first reel ever, one of the clips that I had. But before I get into that, I want to show you or actually share these tips for your demo reel. Number one, people's attention span there it's getting shorter and shorter. You think that it should be five minutes, 10 minutes. I don't think a reel should be longer than 2.30, period. And that's if you have amazing stuff. My current reel is two minutes and 14 seconds. And I'm going to show it to you now to then tell you a story about how it impacted a particular executive. So let me share my screen for you guys to see what my current journalism demo looks like. I think I have it here. Okay, I'm gonna place it on full screen. You're gonna see the, the full two minutes, 14 seconds, and I'll be right here. Oh, is there in Piedras Negras, Mexico. Mariana, what's the situation? Ali, it's a very active scene here. Moments ago, a small riot broke out inside. They started throwing a tables, chairs, and you have about a thousand people desperately waiting for ICE to refrigerate the only food that they have left in their homes. There are around 20,000 people here in the city of Comerio. We've been walking with them, Hallie, for over two days now, and we've already started to see those signs of exhaustion. Shit. Ironically, it is immigrants. It is these people that are coming from Central America. I've spoken to them who still see this country as the beacon of freedom and democracy. I came here 10 years ago. English is in my first language. I didn't have any connections, no green card. And 10 years later, I'm able to sit in this table with some of the finest journalists in the country. That is only possible in the United States of America. Being able to reimagine yourself beyond what other people see, that is the toughest task of all, but it's also the most beautiful. 
my voice to represent who I am now. A Latina immigrant working hard for her dreams, a girl trying to find her space in the world without ever forgetting where she came from. Now think about what you are willing to fight for and go ahead and do it. All you need to do is care enough to come forward. You can change the future. You can write your own story and be a superhero for one person or for millions. The choice is only yours. Thank you so much. That is my current reel. And as you see, it is two minutes, 14 seconds. What do you also see there? Short and powerful. You want to ideally offer a solid minute 30. Second, start with your strongest material. You saw that I started with those action shots at the border in Piedras Negras, Mexico. So if you have action, you should show it in the beginning. So if there are other things that you guys have done that showcase your on-camera presence or your producing that are different, you want to include that there. You saw that I also, in the end, instead of putting emails on there and titles, and I just placed one photo in the edit because I think a lot of these executives, you know, they want you to keep it clean. They already have your contact information. That's how you sent them the demo anyway. They want to see your face and say, wow, is this a person that I can, you know, put a poster off and put a poster off in my office corridor, right? Is this a person that I can see at my local news station? And then finally, get a ton of feedback on it. Use career services, use your teachers, use your future mentors. Take people that aren't from the journalism field and ask them, is, would this grab your attention? Play your demo to them. And if you see them get bored, ask them why. At what moment did I lose you? My first clips, and this, this goes to the people that think that they don't have anything, because I know that that can happen, especially as you're graduating. My first clips were from this newspaper where I wasn't supposed to be reporting on camera, but I needed stuff for my demo reel. And I was determined to use this position as my stepping stone, like I told you guys, to where I wanted to go. So uh, we were assigned a... Uh, immigration rally to go cover it. And I told Gerardo, who was the photographer at the newspaper at the time, I said, would you mind recording me in, you know, a moment of the march? And he said, sure. I had this microphone where, you know, it didn't even have like a cube of the newspaper. I cut it. I printed out the logo of the newspaper and I glued it on this microphone that I took to this march. And in a moment where there was some action, I told Gerardo, record me doing a stand-up. And that was part of my demo reel. And I actually want to show you that clip now because it still lives on YouTube. Hold on. I need to share my screen again. Let me share screen. Here we go. Here we go. A punto de dirigirse hacia el punto céntrico de la marcha en el Mall de Guadalajara. Estamos en este momento en el estacionamiento donde están llegando los buses de todas partes de Estados Unidos. I just realized that you guys weren't able to hear the prior video. The my producer just told me that. Is that true? The full we we were listening to it. It was just like 20 seconds that we weren't able to listen to. Okay, okay. Yeah, so yeah, it, there's I not that much that we missed. I didn't know that when I muted myself here, you guys couldn't That's see okay. the actual video. Anyways, so in this clip that you were able to see from my time at this newspaper, I tried to get in the action and I created an on-camera stand-up even though it wasn't supposed to be my job that day. How can you guys do it now? You have phones, so it's much easier. If you are in New York City and the Women's March is happening, uh, Black Lives Matter is happening, get in the action, you know, get this stuff, put it on your social media, put a little lavalier mic on you, ask a friend to go with you to record you. I can't even tell you the amount of times that my own father used to go with me to record my stand-ups. 
When I worked at this newspaper, I came up with this segment called Dicho y Hecho, where I would ask people their thoughts on headlines of the week. I would literally stand outside the subway and ask people for comment. And then I would do my stand-ups explaining the issue that was at hand. I turned that into a whole segment called La Semana Nueva York. All of this for this newspaper that hadn't hired me to do that to begin with. So make your current job, the job you get, whatever circumstances you have now, into a stepping stone for where you want to go. If you tell me, Mariana, well, I don't have the possibility to go outside, you can do it from home. Record commentary, issues that you know inside and out. You know, in my case, it would be immigration, Venezuela, Latin American politics. Think about something that you're passionate about and record yourself talking about these issues. If you also want to know how you should record it and what tips or what equipment I'm using, even with my team down here in Miami, I've also prepared a Mariana's toolkit of suggestions for you. Audio, ring light, tripod, lavalier mic, if you want to invest in any of that. You don't have to do that right now. I don't want to overwhelm you. But with time, you want to make sure you have your own equipment because that is what will really allow you to go cover the things you want to cover, even if they're not part of your job description. And then finally, resumes, because you guys ask me a lot about resumes. I don't think a resume should be longer than a page. I don't even think Oprah Winfrey's resume should be longer than a page. Mine is one page, and I built it for free in this website called visualcv.com, which I've also included in the toolkit package for you guys for you to build at home. Great. Thank you, Mariana. So um, one of the questions that we have here um, as a group um, has to do, just give me a moment, please. Because now I'm losing the, okay. So how do you describe, this is one question that we have, uh, your level of fluency in Spanish and another, or another language that would be useful as the news outlet. Some people underplay it, other people overplay it. So can you talk about that? Okay. First of all, level of fluency, overplay it, underplay it. You should absolutely play it up if you speak another language. Don't let people sort of make you think that you should not play it up. It's quite the contrary. It's a huge advantage. So make sure you also play it up in the context that is of interest to the news manager or the recruiter. So I remember that I interviewed at NBC and I talked about my Spanish. And then I said, if you want to cover this, that's happening in Latin America now. If you want to cover what's happening with the Latinx community, if you want an insight as to what's happening with the undocumented community, these are tools that will help me do that for you. Think about also and position it in terms of eyeballs, right? have these numbers like there's over 60 million Latinos in the United States right now. Those are people that I can get, you, you know, I can get to watch your network or to read your newspaper if I use this language that is a skill set. And don't ever, you know, I think now that the census numbers are kind of come out in April or May, you know, America's changing. And a lot of these recruiters and executives need to know that. We tend to think of one group as the majority, right? We're even forced sometimes in our case to check the box of minorities if we aren't white in America. I've come to terms with the fact that a lot of the times we minorize. It's a new term that I want to coin for a class today. And I've prepared a slide for you guys today because storytelling is a way to combat that. And here it is, is this notion that minorities are not only less in numbers, but also less human and less reflective of the true American experience. And that is not true. We maximize and we minimize, but we also minorize. And a way to combat that is by having you guys in these newsrooms and is by telling stories and playing up your fluency in other languages. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Vincent? Vincent? Yeah. 
Hi, Mariana. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my question deals with, you know, uh, OPT and CPT, which, you know, is very important for international students, regardless of where your background is. Um, and that's a very important thing to know. So let me just pull up my question real quick here. Um, one second. I want to make sure I get that right. Sorry, I just want to make sure I get the question correctly. So, do you think um, requiring OPT, like telling recruiters, I do need an OPT, you know, I would like to get a visa for longer term, because, you know, for a program like this, you only get one year OPT. Um, do you think that it's something that you should tell recruiters up front, or do you think it's something you should hold back because it could prevent you from getting certain jobs? It's a hugely important question. Uh, as I mentioned, at the Go Like team here, Alejandra, my producer, is here. My sister, Graciela, is also here. She had to go through OPT. I had to go through OPT. I know it's a very precious year where you have to make the most of it. But I also wish that in retrospect, in my case, I mean, I went for the job that gave me what was going to give me a visa after the OPT. And I, and I found the job because they knew about the OPT and because they were going to be able to sponsor my visa. And in retrospect, I thought, well... I spent a whole year at that job, right? That wasn't broadcasting. That wasn't the experience that I wanted to have after specializing in that at the journalism school. I wish that in retrospect, I wouldn't have pigeonholed myself because of the OPT straight away. So my advice to you guys is shoot for the moon for the jobs that you are most passionate about because a lot of these big networks and companies are also going to have more of a legal team to be able to work through that if they fall in love with you to the point, which I'm sure they will, that they want to keep you. I know the inclination is to try and get the job that will give you the visa after the OPT is done, but because you have this year to play around, to stay hungry and to stay foolish and to do all these things, I would aim for what you want most of all, regardless of the OPT, and then that way you get your foot in the door. The other places that will likely sponsor your visa, which are most likely, you know, going to be not as major, for lack of a better term, are always going to be there. So try something like if you want to work at the New York Times, if you want to work at NBC, if you want if the, the places that are the top of the top of your list, try that for three, four months you know, get your foot in the door, get your hands dirty. And the other places will be there. And in fact, the experience that you gain here, you're most likely to get a job at the other spots. Whether you should bring it up by a recruiter or not, I wouldn't at the very beginning in these first five minutes because you really want them, as I said, to fall in love with you. And nobody, it's unfortunate to say, but when you go in there, and I talk about it in my book, when you go in there as an immigrant, you feel like you have a sticky note on your forehead, and you're explaining all this visa stuff and it's almost like a sticky note that reads, don't hire me. I come with problems and issues. So make them fall in love with you. And then when you get the second interview, bring it up to them, not as a problem, just as something that you want to mention to be completely transparent. But it's also not something because legally you can work anywhere for the whole year. It's also something that is not going to hinder them from legally hiring you in that moment. Great, thank you so much. I think uh, Chris, Chris uh, Riotta is our SPJ president and a very strong advocate for our students. We'd like to give him the next question. Hi, Mario. Thank you so much for, uh, for today and presenting. Um, I feel so much more equipped for this career expo that we have coming up after hearing some of your tips. I'm looking forward to creating my, uh, my card and coming prepared like, you know, some scripts and just some, some tips that I've been writing today. Um, I do have one, one question though. Um, you talked a lot about how facing rejection sort of comes, comes with, I guess, really any job, but in journalism, it feels like we get rejected, you know, uh, 10 times a day. And, um, you know, I'm wondering in this career expo, since it's gonna be pretty virtual and unprecedented in how, you know, we're meeting with these folks, uh, uh, I'm 
I'm wondering if some students may, you know, kind of have some pressures with that in the beginning. It may be hard kind of getting uh, acclimated to that. So you may have one or two or three even interviews that don't really go the way you planned. Do you kind of have any tips on maybe after almost having that rejection or that anxiety in your head, how do you kind of deal with that when you still have maybe a high pressure reporting experience or, or like a high level interview that, you, that you're, you're dealing with? Uh, right after that. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for your question. So I know that doing this virtually is, is tough. Getting that presence through the camera lens is important. That's why what I mentioned in the beginning is just important to keep in mind the being present, smiling, looking at people in the eyes, listening to their questions, because sometimes it can get nerve wracking and, and we're not even really uh, listening to what these people are asking of us, their body language. Another great tip when it comes to listening is also if the recruiter or the person on the other end opens up about anything personal, double down on that. If they say, I'm joining from you know, Chicago and it's, snowing here really how how cold is it how long have you been living in chicago i mean if they also want to see your ability to to create empathy because that's going to be your ability also to interview people for their network or for their newspaper listen for those cues and then if everything is not going as planned as you mentioned chris how do you reset it's it will happen when you're reporting I had a ton of bad TV hits, as many of us do. And then you're covering, let's say this literally happened to me, covering a mass shooting, interviewing students live on the air for a show like Morning Joe, which so many people watch, getting off the air and then having that executive call you and being like, you know, you messed up, right? And this was wrong and this was wrong. And then you have to get ready to do another hit in 10 minutes. And you're like, how do I regain my composure and my self-esteem. Breathing helps a ton. It's simple, but it is critical. In my book, Perfectly You, uh, the first chapter is actually about a time where I was robbed at gunpoint in my native Venezuela. For many people on here from Central America or South America, has happened to many of us or our families or our friends. And it was in that moment where I thought, I may not live to tell this tale that I started breathing and counting, breathing and counting. And that is a mechanism, a tool that has stayed with me even to this day. Sometimes it works to just step out of your house or your apartment or even just open a window for a couple of minutes, take in the air, look at the colors in the sky, being present will ground you once again as to what you have to face. And then Olivia Fox Cabain, the woman that I mentioned who wrote The Charisma Myth, she has a great tip when you feel like you're losing it and you're not really present in the moment and you don't even have time to breathe or to go take a walk. She says, wiggle your toes. Wiggling your toes, it just makes you be more aware of the ground below you and immediately centers you in what you're doing. And then, of course, always... Even if you have to fight through it, just smile. Smile because remember, a lot of these recruiters, a lot of these executives, they're just going to remember how you made them feel and the good attitude that you have throughout the interview and hopefully call you for the second round. Thank you so much, Mariana. Um, right now, we would like to open up to the uh, audience here. If anyone here has any questions to Mariana, um, I saw before that... Joaquin Mejia had a question. I'm not sure if he is still here. Um, 